Science fiction is without doubt my favourite genre of film and it's a, it's a great feeling to finally be, be making a sci-fi movie. So the concept for Container actually began with the drawing that you see in the film. At the time I was trying to put constraints on my ideas for budgetary reasons and I was trying to mainly go with a, a single character story that happens in a single location and generally it's the high concept uh, scenario that they're put into that is that makes them stand apart. So the idea that a character could leapfrog over certain events but then come back and live out those moments that he jumped over originally was something that I um, hadn't seen before, hadn't really heard of, but I realized that that was just really just the shell of the idea and that I needed a, a, an emotional story and an emotional arc. And it wasn't until a good sort of two years later that I come up with the idea of Don and Holly and their, their yeah. tragic past and the reasons that Don is doing what he's doing and trying to, to uh, create time travel. When I first read the script, I think it was easy to think of Don two-dimensionally in terms of like mad scientist makes good on an idea, but then the sort of the subtext of Holly and um, the idea of Eve, the child as well, like I think once you peel back the layers of the science and the thing he was doing, like what at the heart of the whole film was his like the reasons he was doing it and and Yes, I think it plays heavily into like he wants to get his daughter back and um, he wants to prove that this time was worth it. So I actually wrote the script with Jesse in mind. We were messaging each other, sort of like, hey, what are you up to? What's, what's, what projects are you working on? You know, just that sort of thing. And eventually, when this came along, uh, I sent it straight to him and, um, and he, he loved it. He jumped on it and he became available at the right time for us to make the film and so it all just worked. He's great, he's a hard worker and he really gets into it. He put in some big hours on this film, he probably put in more hours than me on the actual shoot and um, yeah, I can't thank him enough. Why three minutes and one second? You know, like there was, all, immediately my head went to the practicalities of doing the film. Um, and then, you know, I spoke to Clifton about it and it was very much like a, well, we need it to be three minutes and one second because it was going to be three minutes, but I thought that's too obvious. It needs to have that one second in there, you know, to make it feel like somewhere in there maths happened. And then we just got to pace the film from there. In terms of prep for the role of Don, like obviously Clifton and I talked a lot. Um, but one thing I did that I hadn't, norm that I hadn't done before is I um, wrote a lot of stuff as Don. So I wrote all the, all the notes and stuff on the set, all the post-it notes, all the calculations and stuff like that, that were written by myself. Um, I wrote letters as Don, diary entries as Don. Um, I wrote letters to Liz, uh, well, Holly, played by Liz, as Don, and um, she read them and then she kind of thought about how she would be Holly, you know, in that brief moment. But um, yeah, in, in terms of prep, it was interesting. Like, I don't normally do stuff that's as method as that. But um, it helped, I think, to a, to a degree. And then obviously I just tried not to act too much, which was the, being a stage guy, that was the biggest challenge, is like not to make a stupid face every time there was an opportunity to show an emotion. When I, um, the script had come along, uh, Clifton quite knew what he wanted visually, which makes you know, my job that much easier. Um, so he had a full shot list with pretty much everything and obviously he had to schedule um, schedule out the timings and, and how, how long it would take to shoot but uh, when he sent me to that I, I straight away got onto a, a program that I've been using for a while now called CineTracer and it basically allows you to pre-visualize the lighting not necessarily just the shot size and everything but the actual lighting to give you more or less a real world sense of how how we would light it and that allowed me to you know obviously speed up the process in post-production and give Clifton a, I guess a view into how potentially the film might look um, which I think made him more comfortable to know that where we're going with the lighting and that we can achieve it 
quite easily the best job I've ever had was a, uh, I was a cinema projectionist for three years. Um, this is going back quite a while ago and, and being a projectionist and being in those projection rooms, it, um, it always felt like to me that they were very sci-fi. They felt like these were like rooms that could be on spaceships that you could quite easily change them into, into a, a sci-fi setting and I earmarked projection rooms as a, as a potential location to use for a film and, and uh, I've been trying to find the right script that would fit the location and, and then finally container I thought well this would be the one that I could fit into this location this could be this guy's lab and I was lucky enough that I've I've had a good relationship with Gladstone Cinemas and they, they basically let us like take over their projection room for a couple of weeks which is just amazing and I just can't can't thank them enough this film would literally have not happened if it wasn't for their location and I think it's it's almost a third of the film that location itself it just you know you can't you can't just make that on the budget that we were we were uh, working with you just couldn't make that from scratch and and just being able to step in and just light it properly um, and bring it to life as this this lab I think um, it's really it really brings the production value of the film way up. When I also did the pre-visualization obviously I had to come up with a, a style, a feel that we, we wanted to go with. Uh, I felt that you didn't want to see too much of the room, I, I wanted to be a little bit more, uh, you know, just see the glints of the silver and all the, the big, you know, vents and stuff that you could see in the shots. And, and so I kind of had that feeling, so you know, our movie references were those kind of science fiction movies, so something like the alien movies and some of the you know horror movies but I also you know luckily we had that nice little background with all the machinery in the back to create you know the good production design I guess to 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 give us that science fiction feel that we you know we wanted to get like even though my reference of the film in a way conceptually was like 2001 but it doesn't look anything like it because 2001 was a very bright film compared to this where um, we wanted to keep it quite dark and obviously the idea of container to me is that you know you, you, you are inside this this tiny little space and it's not going to be bright and happy it's actually it's all about just being more or less functional so so luckily we had the, the big 300Ds and we had two lights and I used one to create the background light and one to actually give him the, the main key light uh, and then we had, uh, uh, which is obviously in the, sh in the shots, but it works, which is these little MC lights, and they, they let you do all sorts of color, any color, and you can do all sorts of effects. So that basically allowed us to do that, to switch over from green to red. Clifton had given me um, a brief on how the burns were to look, the radiation burns and um, the depth of the burn, and uh, referenced some radiation burns uh, specifically from the series Chernobyl. It was a really great guide on the beginning of the film and how they were then to progress to something you know really really dangerous and life-threatening injuries. And like Eleni was so good and so professional and so kind and all the rest of it which was great. It was definitely probably the most effects heavy thing I had done as well so like not only the prosthetics but I had a lot of blood uh, because it was being filmed over a number of days, uh, we thought it would be better to pre-build the prosthetics uh, and have them on um, like a mock face as to how they would look in every single stage. So uh, there was quite a bit of building uh, beforehand and uh, marking out and uh, I actually built the prosthetics on my own arm. Uh, and carved each one out to make sure that they looked identical. So from the first day to the fourth day, the scars were looking normal and the same, uh, and the continuity was there. Uh, so from my point of view and the makeup artistry point of view, it was really, really good, which makes me want to do it again. <laughs> During the shoot, I mean, we, we really had, I think, Luckily, I think because Clifton had scheduled out quite well. I mean, I, I was pushing to see if we can maybe try and knock the sh shoot out in three days, but you know, he did do three and a half, four days kind of 
schedule and I think that that ended up working really well because um, it didn't put too much stress on us we, you know we we're a very small crew and uh, you know we pretty much achieved everything we had planned out I think um, you know there's some technical things that made it very hard to be able to do like we had the barrel roll and you know hit <laughs> yeah, to construct a, a, you know, out of using a frame and trying to make it work. Yeah, if you had a proper professional rigging thing, the, this guy would, the, the grip guy would just set up a proper beam with all this stuff, and you could do that very easily. But you know, so the production itself, we, you know, we had a few challenges, and there's, you know, Clifton was quite ambitious, but at least he, you know, he took the approach that he could essentially make something to make it work. And then in, in post production, we could you know fix it up and just make it work 100%. So that, I think that worked really really well during the shoot. And you know, if someone looked at it, they probably you know would probably laugh because of the dodgy little wood contraption that he made to we could do a spin around him. But it worked, you know. And that's the, that's what I love about you know shooting on a lower budget. In some cases, that you have to be you know creative and, and come up with ingenious ways to try and create that shot. Yeah, so in terms of actually shooting, it's probably the most demanding schedule I've done. But I think um, it all sort of went so seamlessly. I didn't, you don't realize in the end that you're doing like 12, 14 hour days, like starting with makeup, obviously in the morning at like 4.30, um, getting the prosthetics done. Initially, the makeup was super quick. It was just like, you know, don't look terrible. <laughs> you know, maybe give him some color and whatever and send him on his way. Um, but then, yeah, by the end, the prosthetics were pretty hectic. Putting them on Jesse was um, quite a breeze, actually. Uh, he was able to nap throughout, which was fabulous, and um, came in handy because we started at 4:30 a.m. most mornings. Uh, then we'd have a he'd go shoot, return to uh, have stage two or stage three put on. We were in that projection room the whole time. We basically, I didn't see daylight for like a whole week because uh, I was getting there it, it, when it was still dark in the morning. I was leaving like eight o'clock at night when it was dark. And first time I saw daylight was on the last day when we, we sort of finished in the afternoon. I was taking my first load of gear down to the car and stepped out and it almost burnt my eyes out, that sunlight. Because the film was shot in sequence, I think that really helped um, because, you know, as, as the character grew more desperate and sort of more strung out like Jesse the actor grew more desperate and more strung out so like it fit perfectly and obviously like I got paler and and all the rest of it so it was it was a it was a well-timed schedule if you were to do other short films where you're like outdoors and or you have to do the location changes it that, that puts a huge amount of stress in trying to get the shots the quality shots I mean you know we can get shots but when you want to get good quality shots and just spend enough time on it. I think we had that, which is quite a luxury, really. You don't get that, that often. And, you know, as you can see, it's quite a, a lengthy short film for, for what it is. So it's quite amazing that we shot that many, you know, that many minutes to, to, to get it and it's all working. And, you know, we had to cut things, you know, and that's, that's always great. When you get to cut things, that means you had enough footage. All the smoke was done on location like um, people who have watched it have said like oh did they do that in post that's really good like no nah, it was all done with a tube <laughs> and the tube would go up my jumpsuit and like the smoke would fill the jumpsuit and then sort of come out of it or whatever but like the first few times we did it it was not a smooth process and I didn't realize that the smoke would actually burn so when I stuck it up you know the leg of my pants or whatever it would sit just below my groin and then the smoke would turn on and it would just it would be exhilarating <laughs> to say the least and I burnt like all the hairs off the inside of my leg and you know like we but we got it right in the end but it looked it looked so good by the end like all that smoke and yeah I think the fi final product turned out really well like I think it's one of those it's good to see that you know there are people you know like Clifton where they want to take the initiative of creating interesting stories and, and but still trying to trying to be a little bit more cerebral in, in, in the way you know because uh, emotional storytelling you know I always think that that's great but if we can have a bit of intelligence to some storytelling I think that's really nice and I think in this film we were able to achieve some of that hopefully uh, yeah he's got more this kind of films to do because I, I like you know I love science fiction so it's, it's a genre films I like genre films generally um, but you know Clifton is one of the only few people I've met where they really are really honed onto that idea of, of doing science fiction style storytelling 
obviously I'm so grateful for the opportunity and I think what is coolest about the idea is it's already fed into more ideas you know like because the premise is both contained within that single story it's also opens itself up anything time travel opens itself up for so many more opportunities and I think retrospectively what's exciting is I don't think we've had a I can't recall having a conversation about what we would do differently on this one all the conversation has been about what we would do if we could do another one you know like the follow up or whatever so I think that's the sign of having made something good and that we're happy with everybody just got in and was and just worked so hard and there's there's something about coming together as a team and and really going through almost like a, a war like that where, where you're just working really hard but you we had so much fun at the same time which is very important you got to make sure you have fun and there's something about the the camaraderie and the the satisfaction that you, you get at the end of that where where a bunch of creative people just really put in like 110% all the way and just come out with this, what we think is a really great product and a really good looking, good looking little film. Um, and I just, you know, I can't thank, can't thank them enough. It was, um, it was an awesome experience and I just hope that we get to, we get to experience something like that, like that again. I'm uh, Tom Keller, I'm from uh, Folklore Sound. Um, welcome to our facility. This is, uh, where we've been working for the last um, little while on um, a short film container, which has been absolutely fantastic experience for, for everybody. Um, Folklore is uh, uh, where we work in post post production sound. We're here in Brisbane. We're in West End, um, and we're one of um, Queensland's uh, well, Queensland's sort of top 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 sound studio. We're very very passionate about sound, what we do, and um, we absolutely love um, making making these stories come to life. Uh, and it's been just a fantastic experience on Container, bringing uh, a, uh, a humble, small room into this massive sci-fi sort of situational world, and it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, so we're at the end of uh, uh, an incredible week um, here with Folklore, um, and getting you know, the films uh, now uh, mastered and, and locked. And uh, what a week it has been. It's, it's been probably the most incredible uh, week of my filmmaking journey, uh, my 20, 20 or so years uh, journey of, of, of film. And, um, you know, the guys here, they're fully professional, yet you would think that you can't so, sort of approach people at that level if you're not at that level. And it's so not the case, um, which I found out. Like, they're just such, like, they've, you know, literally Tom and the rest of the team have just turned into, like, really good friends. So Contain is a, uh, a very special project for me and for, um, uh, for, for Folklore to be involved in because it's been one that has been uh, come out of um, regional, regional Queensland and a story that's come out of regional Queensland of this quality and this calibre and uh, this world that we've, we've built that um, to come out of there is fantastic. And it's just this thing that I'm not, not only getting to work on a great project, but I'm helping to support great projects that are happening outside of the metropolitan areas, which is really, really important to foster because there's so many great ideas out there. People are making all these fantastic things and to be able to actually uh, bring these things to life is, is fantastic. Um, one of the big aspects of it as well was I got to work with Joe, who's um, uh, like a, a very, very talented up and coming sound designer. Um, and I was blown away by the level of detail that he went to to record some of these things that went into the film. And there's, if you see the film, you'll see there's a, uh, without giving too much away, there's a time machine. Um, and uh, that he actually went out and he went and went into workshops and recorded um, old lathes and pushed them to their limits and made these machines struggle and all that sort of stuff. And like to do that, like he could have gone to a sound library, he could have just grabbed some sounds and thrown it in. But that level of enthusiasm is is rare, and it's so great to see. So when creating the time machine, the director had a distinctive note that he wanted this to sound like a backyard job, and it was supposed to be a terrifying menace to this project, uh, to the main character. Um, so my goal was to not make this an elegant machine. It, I wanted to make this like it was something about to fall apart. And doing so, I, I got the opportunity to sample a bunch of different just old industrial equipment 
uh, the one we did sample was a lathe that had a really big trouble charging up with some heavy machinery within it. Um, and from there we used that as the benchmark as just a heaving and hoeing machine that's just struggling to breathe, which I hope ended up being as menacing as I made it to be. Yeah, it was fantastic to be able to get him uh, across the process that we do in, in the post situation and to integrate all of the great work that he'd already done on the project and then add this extra layer of polish, add bits of sound design that I've come up with and it really turned into this collaborative process where we ended up with making this time machine sounds and sound of the film really that I'm super, super proud of. Literally, the movie, you know, I kept saying it all week, the movie really got made here in this room this week. It, it Yes, we had a we had a, 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 you know, a picture and, and all that, but the the whole um, atmosphere that we, we created has really made made this uh, made this movie. And learnings learnings wise, like God, I, I have learnt a lot. Um, I mean, I'm not as uh, savvy as what Joe is when it comes to the pro programming and how to actually control the program and, and whatnot. Um, uh, but I understand the the disciplines and the fundamentals of of, of what's been going on and certain techniques that I've, I've picked up on that you know, I'm definitely going to bring back into my own, my own workflow, which is, I think, really what, 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 what the grant, we, what we set out to try and uh, do with the grant and, um, and I fully, fully achieved that. And I look forward to being able to bring the knowledge that we've, we've uh, gained back to the, to the local you know, filmmaking community up there um, because, you know, and that's what it should be about. It should be about experiencing these, these things and, and, and you know, bringing those experiences and teaching each other's each other that, that stuff, and, and just it brings everybody up and up and up. And I think the other great thing about this, uh, you know, apart from coming out of regional Queensland and stuff, and, and and working with people like Joe, is that Clifton has been passionate about film for so long, and that we've been actually chatting about wanting to work together for, for quite a few years now, and um, it's been so great to see, and it's such a great thing for me to actually end up getting to actually do it and um for to do it on a project that is one sci-fi is one that has a great script that's really really detailed that shows all of the different aspects of of what it, thinking about what it's actually like to jump through time and and all that so and there's so many easter eggs in this project that are just a, a sign of a really good script um and and then just the easygoing nature and the quality of the direction and all that kind of stuff is just shining through on the project um, that made my job really quite easy. Like, um, it was just absolute pleasure. I love working on sci-fi. Sci-fi is a genre that is just, you know, <laughs> it's just great. Like, it's 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 um, it's 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 wonderful. You get to world build in sci-fi for sound. You get to actually make uh, some of the. Ex outside the frame basically there's a lot of world outside the frame that you you can make and bring in and that sort of thing that will inform the audience of what they should be feeling what they should be experiencing what maybe that world looks like how that you know what's the emotional arc of the characters going through all this kind of stuff that is not you're not actually seeing but you're hearing and it's experiential then like this whole thing turns into this kind of like real big experience so the first time coming to folklore i it was one of these dreams where i didn't see it coming so soon um coming through these doors and seeing the the mixing area out here i automatically just fell in love with everything that's about to happen and i loved absolutely every second of starting it i learnt <laughs> equivalent of what I could probably learn in a trimester's worth of study purely through the can-do attitude of, of my mentors and everything that I've done by simply be able to sit beside someone who's done this for so long and has been so good at it that has already changed the way I would go about mixing and sound designing. At one point we were like we need this atmospheric sort of sort of sound and Tom's like I oh, know exactly what we need and he like looked up emu sounds I'm like what emu sounds and he's like trust me trust me and he puts it in and it's like it doesn't sound like an emu and it makes this it sound like this atmospheric sound that's going on in up in the up in the uh, top of the top of the room sort of thing and I just love that part of it you know like you would not imagine that an emu 
sound or, or, or even making a sound would be in a science fiction film where there's no animals <laughs> at all. Another exciting aspect of this uh, project is uh, how, 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 it, how it will be experienced by the audience. So we're facing a pretty bit of a bleak situation in cinema at the moment where not a lot of people are going to see films in, in that format. Um, so it was a big consideration for us to try and make this film work on a lot of different platforms and I think we are working in some of the really amazing immersive platforms like that that are, that are out there they do the cinematic ones you know you seven one and like working out ways that we'll be able to like translate that into rooms that are Dolby equipped and uh, at, Dolby Atmos equipped and that sort of thing and like how that translates but also like what does it sound like on headphones what does it sound like on a laptop and like that is a huge huge part of it and it is just the way that an audience can experience this sort of stuff it's 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 trying to bring it to a point where you can understand as an audience the world that you're in but also being able to experience that world on whatever device you're on or whatever platform you're, you're using um, and it was a really big important part of what we did and I mean doing it in this immersive surround I mean it's something if you can experience this film wherever you can experience it in the way that we we did it in this massive immersive formats uh will will be absolutely wonderful but if not grab a really good pair of headphones and dive on in the actual quality of of, of the mix like we've created this crazy big sounding film which yet still has quiet moments uh quite emotional moments but um you know tom was like how how, how far can we push this i'm like let's just blow their heads off like let's just make these big sounds and thanks to Joe and the work that he did with the, the time machine um, you know warming up and, and, and whatnot like it's 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 really gonna like punch and and I love that sort of stuff like that's the type of movies that I enjoy watching I would do this again in a heartbeat I would love an environment like this every day even if it's just the simplest tasks even just grabbing coffee pe for people being in this environment alone is enough for me to learn and adapt to the industry of this level easily. I cannot stress enough that this sort of environment and practice can be enough alone to really grasp the nature of things around here and the expectancy of what is required of you. Honestly, one of the biggest things that came out of this week for me, and I didn't expect it would happen, but like I said, I was thinking I was gonna go into it and learn new techniques on how to do stuff, which I did, but the biggest thing I learned was it's given me the confidence to uh, to know that, yes, we, I can I can produce this sort of work, you know, that, that the stories that I wanna tell can go up, up to that level. And I think, you know, I spent the whole time sitting there beside Tom uh, at, the, at the desk and like just with a smile on my face the whole time. And um, I think it was about halfway through the week and I said to him uh, that, you know, I, I've never known, I've never been so sure that this is what I want to do, like make movies. Like I've, this experience has really grounded me and really uh, going, yes, this is it. Like we're gonna, you know, you're gonna keep pushing forward with this. And um, you know, the bar's been set. So from now on, like, yeah, yeah, I'll be back here, no, no doubt, and, and yeah, continue the relationship. And I'm 